Hello everyone. Welcome to this talk about the Android Game Development Kit and our new adaptability pillar. I'm Scott Carbon Ogden, a product manager working on Android games and graphics. Joining me today is Peyong Lin, a staff software engineer on Android games, who'll be talking you through the latest adaptability additions. Charlie Stokes, a staff development relations manager at ARM, has also kindly agreed to join us today. He'll be sharing some cool demos of these technologies in action. But before we get to all that, I'm going to start by refreshing your memory on the Android Game Development Kit and letting you know about some of our most exciting updates. As a reminder, the AGDK is a range of tools and libraries to help you develop, optimize, launch, and iterate on high-quality Android game titles. Everything in the AGDK follows three key tenets. It's all code built for gaming. All of our libraries are intended to be used in C or C++ and have been built and tested with performance in mind. We intend to reduce fragmentation. The tools and libraries we're going to show you today work across many different Android SDK and NDK levels. And lastly, these are tools that were built by Android for Android. These features will be enhanced by future Android platform updates. They'll be updated before new versions of Android land, and they're backwards compatible, having undergone extensive testing. Thus far, we've introduced three key areas of game development where the AGDK can help. Firstly, we have a variety of integrated workflow tools to make Android development efficient. For example, the Android game development extension for Visual Studio. Then there are C and C++ development libraries to make games easier to build, debug, and maintain. For example, game activity, which can help you reduce your ANRs. And lastly, we have a focus on performance optimization to improve your game's performance both pre- and post-launch, such as with the Android GPU Inspector. So AGDK launched in July 2021, and the response has been truly great. Almost one-third of games now use some element of the Android Game Development Kit, whether it be integrating the frame pacing API, using the Game Development Extension, or one of our many other features. We've heard and shared many great stories of your successes with these products. Cat Daddy switched NBA 2K to use game activity and reduced ANRs by 35%. You can learn more about that in Victor and Artyom's talk on the AGDK libraries. Last year, we also talked about how The Witcher used Android Performance Tuner to increase device reach by 10%. But there's still so much more left to do. So we made extensive improvements to our existing AGDK suite, which I'll run through now. And then we'll talk about the whole new area that we're adding in after that. Let's start with our updates to the Android Game Development Extension for Visual Studio, also known as AGDE. We first released AGDE in 2019 to address the need of native C++ Android game developers who use Visual Studio as their primary IDE. Since then, we've continuously improved the tool, adding more and more features. Most recently, we've exposed instrumented profile-guided optimization in the, in the IDE. This feature gives your code a boost by tuning it based on the way your code actually executes at runtime, deprioritizing edge cases and outliers. Most developers can expect to see a 5% improvement in CPU cost, and depending on the workload, you may see even better results than that. We've also added Ninja build support to our latest release. We wanted to give users the ability to easily open their project in Android Studio so you can get the benefit of its rich support for Java, Kotlin, and JNI, such as being able to have same session Java and C++ debugging, editing your Gradle build, and analyzing and upgrading your Gradle dependencies. With Ninja, you can easily open your AGDE projects in Android Studio. Address Sanitizer, or ASAN, is a feature that helps you debug memory issues in your game. Normally, these are difficult to figure out because you only find them when your game crashes, not when the memory overwrite or misuse actually occurs in the first place. ASAN allows you to build your app with guards and checks in place to help you find the error when it happens. In the latest version of AGDE, we've switched over to a new lower level control channel. This allows us to support multiple simultaneous device connections. This should help improve debugging and device control reliability when you have Android Studio open alongside Visual Studio. For example, when you're debugging Java language and native code at the same time. And finally, we're now releasing AGDE as a Visual Studio extension package, or VSIX. This should reduce the size of our distribution and make it easier to install and manage from inside Visual Studio itself. If Visual Studio is a core part of your normal development environment, we strongly encourage you to check out AGDE and we're always looking for feedback on ways that we can make it even better and better support our game developer community. We've also updated all our libraries based on your feedback. Now they should be more powerful and easier to adopt. You can find out more about the specifics in Victor and Artem's talk on the AGDK libraries. 
Writing your own J and I can be a pain. It can be frustrating, lead to memory leaks, A and Rs, or even crashes. Yet on Android, many of you have to use the Java programming language to access various system settings or third-party libraries. To make things easier for you, we're releasing a new tool that takes in a JAR file and generates source code in either C or C Sharp. This output code is just a lightweight interface for accessing the Java language code without needing to write, debug, and maintain your own JNI. It's available now as a beta, so try it out. We'd love your feedback. So those were the updates to our existing pillars, but we wanted to expand the AGDK to solve more developer problems. We've heard your consistent feedback over the years that it can be hard to tune your game to the diverse Android ecosystem. Every device has a unique performance profile and a different thermal situation. For example, being out in the sun in a plastic case leads to a very different performance situation to being in a cold, dark room. To help address this, we're also adding a whole new section to the AGDK, Adaptability. So what do we mean by adaptability? We mean tools and libraries to understand and respond to changing performance, thermal, and user situations in real time. The key elements of our adaptability suite are the ADPF Hint API, which helps the OS ramp up and ramp down CPU frequency based on what's going on in your game. The ADPF Thermal API, that gives your game's signals about how close you are to being thermally throttled. Game Mode API, which advises you about the user's preference for performance or battery. And lastly, the Game State API, which lets you tell the OS about what you're doing so that it can adjust to meet your performance needs. Unlike the other elements of the AGDK, several of the adaptability elements include direct system calls, so you will have OS dependencies. Now I'll pass over to Payong to go into a little more detail on these tools and libraries. Thank you, Scott. Hello, I'm Payong, and I'm going to walk you through our adaptability framework APIs. Let's start with ADPF. If you haven't heard about it, ADPF is a range of APIs that allow applications to respond to and influence performance characteristics in Android. Let's first take a look at the performance hint APIs. Typically, schedulers have very little information to determine strategy effectively without additional information passing from the upper stack. The performance hint APIs are to tell the OS about the target and CPU duration of the workload so that the scheduler can deploy a more effective strategy reducing frame drops, and improving power efficiency. Also, ADPF is more aware of the core topographies and much more reliable than games taking a guess with set affinity. And as an example, here's how a default Linux scheduler would behave when the workload comes in and out. The CPU governor can take all the way up to 200 milliseconds to ramp up to maximum frequency from idle state, or back down to lowest frequency when the workload is completed. So to use Performance Hint APIs, you will need to use Performance Hint Manager first by identifying threads that complete a workload and then figure out the target CPU duration for the workload. Typically, this ties to the frame rate that your game targets and then call the Performance Hint Manager .session API to create a hint session for the workload. As an example, threads that fulfill a workload could be the main thread of the game and the dependent worker threads and IO and or the audio threads. The performance hint APIs are currently used across the Android graphics stack and Chrome. We have seen drastic improvement on both sides. It is also available in the latest Unity. Besides the performance hint API, we also have a fixed performance mode that you as developers can turn on through an ADB command, which will set the upper bound and the lower bound of the CPU GPU frequency to allow reproducible profiling and performance debugging. So performance hints APIs are to influence the Android OS. What about reacting and monitoring performance characteristics of Android? The thermal APIs will allow you to do so. There are two major APIs that you as developers should take a look at if you care about thermal and thermal throttling. The first API is a callback through Power Manager that allows you to get notified when the thermal throttling state has changed. For example, when the device starts to have moderate thermal throttling from the previous light thermal throttling state. The second API pro provides an estimate of thermal headroom the device currently has before it hits severe thermal throttling. The returned value is a non-negative float number about how much of the thermal envelope is in use or will be in use within the forecast time, and 1.0 by definition is severe th throttling. These two APIs are also available through a Thermal Manager in NDK. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the On Thermal Status Change Listener API. 
There are essentially three stages of thermal status that you as developers will know. No thermal throttling, some thermal throttling but has no significant impact on the performance, and significant throttling that impacts the device performance. But then when you receive a callback about the device hitting any of the significant throttling, the performance of the games already suffer, and it takes bigger efforts to, to turn things around. So what you as developers will want to do is to constantly monitor the thermal headroom and check how close the device is to severe throttling, and you will want to make sure you reach a stable balance beneath 1.0. So projecting what that means into a graph. Over the time, as users play the games, the device temperature starts to go up and starts to run into thermal throttling. If games don't monitor the thermal headroom, no actions are taken ahead of the time, and the performance starts to degrade, which impacts user experience. But if games monitor the thermal headroom, especially monitor how fast thermal hydrogen is moving. The workload can be adjusted dynamically by the games and hence avoid being severely throttled, maintaining a sustainable user experience. Typically, you as developers will want to monitor the throttling status with the callback and the hydrogen API and adjust the rendering resolution and or reduce the frame rate in order to recover from or avoid thermal throttling. So now you know about what ADPF is and the shapes of the APIs. Does it really benefit your games? I'm going to hand over to Charlie from ARM to talk about ARM's integration with ADPF. Hi, I'm Charlie Stokes, Staff Developer Relations Manager at ARM. Here, we're focusing on mobile CPU performance and how we, along with Google, can help you improve the performance of your games. The Adventures of Dr. ARM is a research game built in-house at ARM, made in Unity. The game was built to be like modern mobile phone games, to model their behavior on mobile phones and allow us to test how different technologies might work on a game on ARM devices. The sort of thing that we included in the game to mimic the workload a mobile game might go through during play includes particle effects, dust, mist, smoke, and fire effects, lighting effects, post-processing effects like bloom, depth of field, screen space ambient occlusion, and motion blur. All of these add up to be an intense workload for a game on mobile. These features help enhance the atmosphere and experience of a game, but are not essential to gameplay. We included adaptive performance in the game through the APIs that Google gave us and integrated them into the game. We had two different modes to switch between, a scenario where adaptive performance was switched on and one where it was off. We compared the two play modes and put them side by side. As you can see from this video, with adaptive performance enabled, when the workload started to get intense, adaptive performance was able to maintain the frame rate on the game. It also brought down the temperature of the phone. In comparison, when adaptive performance was switched off, the game was not able to maintain the frame rate and the temperature of the phone rapidly climbed. Adaptive performance provides the benefit of having the game's art, lighting, and post-processing effects, but also scales back effects and the time to peak demand from the device. When throttling was imminent, we turned off effects in Dr. Arm that were included mostly to enhance the mood of the scene, but this did not impact gameplay. You can see this here in the differences between visual effects prior to throttling and then with adaptive performance on. This can also be seen with changes to post-processing as well. This is also shown in the thermal measurements taken during gameplay. These graphs were taken during a play of Dr. Arm. With no adaptive performance enabled, we can see an average of about 55 degrees Celsius for the skin temperature. We can also see that about two minutes into gameplay, the device enters a severe thermal state that it never recovers from. In comparison, with adaptive performance enabled, the temperature of all mobile processors drops, indicating performance improvements, and the skin temperature of the phone drops to about 45 degrees Celsius. The thermal state of the device then remains light. Moving on to performance, here we have a range of CPU cores from ARM that were tested during this run. The bars on the graph show the average duration the core was active through runtime. The color indicates the frequency for that duration. Overall, we see large net performance improvements. There's a large reduction in the amount of work being done on the big cluster, as well as keeping the mid-range CPU cluster at a lower frequency. This shows major gains in the performance of the system and game projects on Android. Thank you, Charlie. Besides ADPF, we have other adaptability tools. 
the Game Mode APIs, and the Game State APIs. The Game Mode APIs were introduced in Android 12 that allows games to understand the user's performance preferences between performance and battery saving. The goal of using the APIs is to ensure your games deliver stable frame rate while still fulfilling users' needs. You will want to make sure you check the user's intention during on resume and interpret the user's intention into the gaming experiences. For example, if a user wants to battery save, the game may need to run at lower frame rates such as 30 FIPS with the lower graphics fidelity. If left unimplemented, OEMs may intervene upon your game, for example, reducing the rendering resolution or throttling the frame rate. The game state APIs can be used to inform Android OS about the game state. This will allow the OS to have extra information to optimize the scheduling strategy. An example to use game state APIs to call set game state API in Game Manager. This example informs the OS that the game is loading contents. So we walk through all the tools that make up the adaptability pillar, which help your games deliver sustainable performance across devices. If you would like to learn more about the tools, check out go.co slash android slash agdk. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Happy game building.